All right, hello, how's it going? We are live here on Facebook and we are doing the Men's Monday Mastermind. And today what we're gonna be talking about is what is regenerative farming? So one of the things um, that we were talking about before we started this call is that a lot of people don't really know what regenerative farming is or the, even, even like sometimes the difference between organic and the difference between soil quality and the difference between like nutrient dense soil and soil that's like nutrient depleted and like how does that interact and in, in, um, interfere with how, how do the nutrients get to the plants and some people don't realize that the soil itself is like the food and the food source and the nutrient source of the plants and whatever they get from there is going to make them nutrient dense or not nutrient dense. Um, and so stuff like that. So we figured we would come on here and share a little bit, you know, of our experiences um, with you and uh, talk a little bit about, you know, what is the difference between maybe regenerative soil and maybe conventional, conventional soil um, and maybe conventional farming. Right. So I'll just share a little bit of some of my experiences and then we can jump into Mike and some of your experiences um, in this. So for me personally, um, I've done some organic farming. Um, in San Diego. I live in San Diego right now. So it's been a few years, um, but a few years ago, I did some organic farming for about eight months or so. Um, and what we did is we used, it was organic farming as well as the focus was regenerative farming. Um, and the focus was also edible landscaping. So it's kind of a unique kind of operation. Um, so it's like a blend of the, a few different things because most people like San Diego is kind of like, okay, you know, I want to make it pretty, you know, make it look nice. And so the idea was to blend those, those, that together, but with real food. So like, yes, it looks nice, but also you can eat from it. Um, and so, um, what we did is we would plant, you know, would build boxes for them, build gardens for them, set it up in their yard. And it was a little bit of mix with urban um, kind of farming because some of the some of the homes you know were were unique and like in like urban landscaping and needed to you know find ways to to build a box and get soil in there, um, but some had like a lot of space you know a lot of space where it's like you know what you could do a lot with this yard um, that you, the that you have right here, and so that was a really really good experience and learned a lot you know from someone that's been doing that for like over eight years. And so it was great to learn from, from, from him and his experience. And it was really helpful to see it and like touch it and put your hands in the soil and, and feel it and see the plants grow and see the way, you know, that you didn't need chemicals. Like, you know, just seeing that firsthand, like you don't need these chemicals, like everyone tells you, you know? Um, and so that was really powerful to see because sometimes people don't realize that either, right? They're just like, I, yeah, I think, you know, we need it. Like, what, what are you going to do if you don't have the chemicals? There's going to be, there's going to be flies everywhere. You got, you're going to have to shoot the squirrels. You're going to have to shoot the wolves. You're going to have to, and it's just like, have, have you done this before? Like, have you, and so they haven't. And so when you've done it a little bit, like you can see, like, even just like, there's ways to deter pest. Like you don't need to have a chemical. There's like deterrence, you know, distractions, you know, even like, putting like fake snakes and fake, you know, birds and fake things to like make them realize, hey, I'm going to stay away from there. Like there, no one was harmed. No animals were harmed, you know, in that process. And they don't realize that, that that's a thing, you know, um, that you could do. And then on top of that, the food that we that we share, right? I've been inside, you know, where they grow the, where they, well, I've learned how they grow the food from the people that grow the food. Um, and one of the things that they do is what we're talking about was regenerative farming as well. And um, so I learned how they are able to recreate the soil and build the soil from scratch, which is something really unique that a lot of places don't do because they're like, well, that takes a lot of time, right? But once you, it actually saves you time in the long run. If you build the soil right the first time, it takes a little bit of extra time, right? But if you build the soil right the first time, it can regenerate itself multiple, multiple times over and over and over and over for many years. It actually saves you time. And that's why they did it for thousands of years. They, it's only been within the last hundred years or so that we totally said, we're going to change it all up. 
Um, but essentially those are some of the things that just a brief, I mean, I've been inside the Amazon, I mean, not the, the rainforest of Belize. We grew food there. We grew food inside the rainforest with nutrient dense soil from the, from the actual leaves of the rain, I mean, from the, from the rainforest itself, it replenished itself on its own. Um, so I've seen food grow there as well as parts of there that are like really the more swampy where you like, you have to do it a little bit different. It's closer to the ocean, right? And the soil isn't so deep and there's ways to grow there too. So that was totally, I thought I was like, oh, I know, I know how to grow, but it was a totally different method. You had to grow very different because there was like a, there was, there was a certain amount of soil that was like maybe this thick, not so deep. Then right underneath there was like this, um, it would look like almost like concrete, but it was like, I forgot what it was called, but it was like a really thick layer. And you had to get through that in order, you had to dig deep beyond that in order to get, um, is maybe like, like another, maybe two feet that you had to get through that to like another level of soil. And if you didn't do that, some of the plants wouldn't grow like the palm trees or the coconut palms. There's a lot that could grow with that small amount of soil on the top, but then there was a whole other set of plants that you needed to get through for the roots to get through to for the the tap root to get through down so that it would get enough water source because that was blocking the water source um and some of the roots could grow sideways all the way out so like learning that like like oh, there's all these different like things and so like even people that grow in california or they grow in texas or they grow in florida or they grow in in canada it's different it's it this it's each, the way the dirt is, is very different. And the way the soil is very different and what you do to it is, is different. I learned that just, that's just a little bit of experience that I learned, but I know people that never even, they never even stepped foot in a garden or a farm or anything like that, you know? And even before that, like I was folk, I was looking at factory farms, you know, like, cause that was my, I would like go onto them, like inside of them, like dairy farms and pig farms and slaughterhouses and like, you know, like, even people don't do that. Like you don't even know what that people don't even know what that's like. So I have like a huge, like a, a, a not a, a pretty decent perspective on like on some of these farms and what they look like on the inside and even what's ethical and what's not ethical. You know, when someone's like arguing plant farming versus animal farming, like, have you been inside those farms? Like the terror and the the fear that you feel inside is very different from a strawberry farm to a, a pig slaughterhouse. You know, like it's very different. Um, so anyways, yeah, Mike, what would you like to say to this? Well, that reminds me of a saying uh, that, you know, I remember hearing years ago where it's about discussing, you know, with people, the ethics of, of what food they're eating. And it goes, you know, if you believe that uh, a slaughterhouse is that ethical, then why do we bring children on school trips, apple picking and not to slaughterhouses? And how would you feel? You know, like if we suggested, like, let's take the kids to a slaughterhouse for their trip because it's ethical and it's fine. Right. And so when you when you contrast them like side by side, it's it's quite stark, the differences. But as, as to the farming, um, you know, I think you've hit on an important point in the sense that a lot of people don't really know where their food's coming from and how it's being farmed. Right. And I think like conventional farming. Uh, there's all these sort of thoughts and concerns that people have, like, like you said, prey and predators and, and what's out in the field and having to kill them and all this stuff. But a lot of the problems that, you know, the bugs and, and all that kind of stuff, a lot of these problems are coming from the fact that conventional farming has gone over to monocropping, right, which is where you take a huge plot of land, you flatten it out. You know, you grow one type of thing. They're all in like a perfect uniform line. Like obviously this is beneficial for the economy of growing, right? It's beneficial for making money, but that's not how nature works. Nothing in nature grows in perfect straight lines. Nothing in nature has like these wide open clearings. You know, so you start to introduce these other problems like erosion, for example. You know, you're talking about like growing in the rainforest. I mean, as soon as you start to remove the ground under those trees in the rainforest, then the soil starts to erode, they start to die. They no longer have this cycle of dropping down all these nutrients via leaves and stuff, right? And, and breaking it down. So regenerative farming 
is there's there's a lot of different you know like I, neither of us is an expert but just from what i've read and researched and what i've i've practiced you know a little bit on my own um it involves stuff like choosing which crops you're growing and letting them you know break down not tilling the soil letting the roots break back down into the soil letting the you know the roots grow into the soil so like alfalfa alpha, uh growing right that investment you're talking about spending 13 years growing alfalfa alpha on a plot of land so that you get these roots that grow like you know 100 plus 150 plus feet deep into the ground right and really spread out you know uh cavities in the soil for air and water to flow through and animals you know worms to get through and all this kind of stuff you know there's it's a and that also replaces the nitrogen in the soil which is essential which is usually what's what's missing from from the from the conventional farming is the replacement of the nitrogen that's why a lot of the fertilizers are replacing the the nitrogen because it isn't it isn't um it isn't being regenerated yeah, you know, nitrogen and potassium and, um, you know, there, 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 there's various uh, items that people think calcium, magnesium, whatever, there's all these different like plant supplements, right? But essentially, that's because we've stripped away the layers that nature built into growth that allow for these replenishments, right? And so, you know, talking about, let's say, like bugs and, um, you know, pests and stuff like that. Well, there's something called companion plants or companion planting where you, as you said, the deterrence, right? You can place various plants like marigolds, for example, help deter certain pests. They're also a lovely looking flower. And it just so turns out when you plant them with specific other companion plants, they complement each other with their roots in the ground, with the nutrients they're using you know, what's still available. Um, one of the issues with conventional farming is, is like I said, growing all that one crop, monocropping, and then often doing it, you know, two years in a row, let's say, to and knowing, okay, if we do it two years in a row, it will grow, but we will deplete the soil. We're going to, you know, kill that soil off now, as opposed to what you're saying, which is an investment of first off building the soil so that it, it's able to regenerate itself. But then, um, as we're discussing here, like the, with regenerative farming, switching through crops and doing companion planting and knowing, okay, well, if I grow, as a simple example, if I grow corn, let's say, which is a really common farmed food on this space of land, this area in front of me, that's however, however large, uh, next year, I need to switch it to another crop because corn is going to absorb. And then you look at your list of, of nutrients, right? And so we need to switch over to something that will complement or replenish that or allow the replenishment of that because it only absorbs these other things. And then, as, as I said, you know, allow the leaves to break back down, allow stuff to fall into the garden. Um, you know, composting is a big, a big factor of regenerative farming, right? Reintroducing the nature has a, a cycle that it's built, right? So, you know, plants that grow, let's say you're growing tomato plants and you have tomatoes. Uh, for myself on my own property, at least when I grow tomatoes and I cut them up and there's the parts that I, I don't eat, um, you know, I put that back in my compost and break it back down because I look at it as an energy cycle. You know, these nutrients or this this material was constructed out of the soil. That means these nutrients or some form more complex of those nutrients needs, needs to be re reintroduced. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's where like, when you go back to like monocropping, as an example, not only are you well, not doing the right things for the soil, like what we talked about, like setting it up for regenerating, but you take when it's time to harvest, they often take the whole plant away. Um, and like you said, like it's a whole new field and, and the the problem with that is there's a few things there's many problems with that but a couple of the problems with that is one the sun now is coming down onto that soil and basically it has no protection so it's being it's being kind of cooked essentially and 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 being depleted you know of its of its life force um because it's not it's not being shaded properly like it like it should be um so that often dries it out and kills the soil and then the other thing is what's replenishing the soil to get it back 
you know, the, another huge of the, the nitrogen source and, and a lot of the nutrients that the soil needs to be replenished are coming from all those leaves, all of the leaves, you know, and even if you look at like, even in the city or wherever you're at and you see leaves fall, they rake all the leaves away, you know, but what's actually better for you is keep all those leaves underneath the tree, keep it all together, get it all, all, all you know, back where it's supposed to. Why do you think the leaf falls and drops where it, where it drops? Like underneath the tree for the it's for the root system it's for the soil it's to replenish the soil it's supposed to be there right or it can be used by other animals or whatever you know but it's supposed to be there um and it has its own cycle like you said nature has has its way of doing what it's doing that's why you look at the rainforest with in parts where no man has ever been you don't need to haul in a bunch of animal manure to make sure that the rainforest is growing <laughs> You don't need to do anything. It's like the best soil in the world already. Um, and that's, that is the natural cycle. You know, the, all the leaves are falling where they're supposed to fall and they're being, the nutrients are being replenished, you know, and the seeds and the animals are eating and they're having some droppings, you know, here and there, but it's really, the majority is, the majority is the trees can replenish themselves. That's why, that's why we say it's so, it's so powerful. Like, you could sequester almost like almost all of the carbon in the world, you know, just by planting enough trees and you just be like, everything would be fine. You know, that's a whole nother benefit that they also have. Like they're, they're just incredible what they do. And that's why you see the rainforest can create so much abundance of soil and life. And it's the most, it's the most nutrient dense part of the world, but also the most dense part of life and also the most amount of water. And it's called a rainforest it even creates its own water. Um, the trees create water too, which is, which is like, I didn't even believe that was possible until I saw it. I was like, I hear about it, but when you like see like how it happens and how much rain is created, it's like, I know why it's called a rainforest. Like it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting. And so how does this compare to like, okay, you getting foods like this, right? That's why we're sharing these foods all the time. Cause it's so different. And it makes such a difference. How do the, how do foods like this make a difference? You know, when it comes to like conventional food, like if you grow food, regenerative soil, like what we're talking about, you know, clean soil, how it's supposed to be, how it's supposed to be grown. How does that make a difference in terms of health or nutrients and stuff like that? Well, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's one of the things I think that is not discussed enough it's becoming more well known but i think a lot of people are not aware of this and and i think because of that organic food and um regenerative farm food is sort of scoffed at right or people think like oh it's nonsense or they're just it's a gimmick they're trying to make money on you um ultimately though when you start spraying pesticides, when you start monocropping, when you start doing these things, it's depleting and damaging the soil, as we've discussed, right? And you're not replenishing or re-adding, you know, the elements that it needs. Um, and so the plant, people don't think about this, but the plant that you eat that allegedly has, you know, vitamin C or vitamin A or vitamin K or whatever nutrients that it has, it's developing that or, you know, pulling that up out of the soil right? None of the elements in the soil. And, you know, so when you look at the quality of soil and regenerative farming versus uh, traditional farming, there's a huge, huge, huge difference. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to misquote because I, I don't off the top of my head know like the, the data sets well enough, but I know, you know, there's been studies done on uh, crops that are grown in conventional um, farming practices and they have a reduction of you know let's say up to 30 40 percent of of their vitamins right and that's that's assuming that those are you know being grown to the best uh standard and qualities for that conventional farming you know there's a lot of food that they probably wouldn't meet that standard um but you know I've, I've read and heard of studies where you know there's there's so much of a difference that you know one conventional carrot would uh or sorry one uh, regeneratively farmed carrot would be equivalent to about, you know, three, 400 um, uh, regeneratively, sorry, conventionally farmed uh, carrots. 
Sorry, give me one second here. I got I got chaos going on in the background. Yeah, no, it's all good. I'll pick up. Yeah, so that is something that is of relevance for sure as far as when you're eating these foods. And something that came to mind when you were saying that is when you look at the nutrition label and you look at the label and let's say it says, you know, X amount of vitamin C, you know, based on based on the the, nutri- the nutrients that are in there or the food that is in there, right? And that's a baseline, you know, like if you say a carrot, it's going to be a baseline number of, let's say vitamin C or whatever, right? Or, or whatever, mangoes, baseline of vitamin C. But what there isn't going to be a range like in that particular item, right? For a soil that is nutrient depleted or a soil that is very nutrient rich, right? So you might read a label, right? That is something from a regenerative farm. And you're like, oh, well, it doesn't seem like it's that much more. Well, it's going based on what the standard is for that item, you know, versus that it's actually, you know, that could be three to four to five times more nutrient dense than what it says on the label because they have these standardized labels. But also there isn't ben- like the, the health foods and the veggies and the fruits and like all the good stuff that's really good for you. They don't have, they don't get all these benefits. You know what I mean? They're, they're, it's a lot harder, you know, for them to penetrate, you know, um, any kind of any kind of things like that. Like you could go to a fast food place and they could say juiciest, best, biggest burger ever and world famous and no studies needed. No questions are needed, you know, 1599 and people will buy it and no one bats an eye. Right. But the minute someone, you know, mentions, you know, something is a little bit healthier than what's actually being mentioned, right. Hold up. You know, you can't say that, you know, like there's all these alarm bells. It's just so, it's just so interesting. But anyways, continue if you, where you're at, if you want to say. Oh, I, I sort of lost my train of thought there, but. Um, you're just talking about the difference between the regenerative soil and like comparing the carrots, you know, situation um, on regenerative farmed carrots versus conventional carrots. That's where you're yeah, at. So you're, you know, you're some of the claims and, you know, I'm not coming up with this data. And I, again, I'm not an expert, so, but some of the claims that I've heard are, are you know, uh, so extreme as to say that three to 400 carrots, uh, you know, that can be grown in like a really poorly, uh, farmed area would be the equivalent of like one, you know, regeneratively farmed carrot or really what, what equates to a traditionally grown carrot. Cause it, it's not like regenerative farming is reinventing the wheel or that we're trying to say that people have are doing something that no one's ever done before it's like these are you know when you're talking about the nutritional value in food i would say the main problem and the main metric that we need to be concerned about is when we say you know a a red pepper has x amount of vitamin c i think it in supermarket standards it doesn't you know let's just say it people say you know one one pepper has 60 percent of your vitamin c um, I think a, a conventionally grown pepper probably has like 5%, maybe 10%, because you also consider not only is it grown in depleted soil, but it's picked early, which means it hasn't fully developed everything it needs to. Um, so I think that's a, a major concern that really where you get, you know, people will hear that number of like three to 400 to one and say like, that's, that's nonsense. That's such a lie. And it's like, well, no, no, because we're not saying a, a regular carrot versus regenerative farming. We're saying conventional is like super, super watered down, super depleted. The soil has been abused for decades, let's say in these big corporate. And problems. really quick, I think that number is, is, is talking about the vitamin density. And like, I think it's comparing vitamin A. So it's not like all of these different things. It's like this one that the carrots is known for, you know, um, being high in. And I think that's, that's where, where it comes. And that's where like a huge part of the world and a huge part of the issue that we see like in America, specifically in the Western part is that we're overfed and undernourished. Well, how can you be eating way more food than you've ever eaten? How can we be eating more food than we've ever been eaten in the history of our history? and have less nutrients in the history of our history. <laughs> like what, you know, like, and it's so, a soil, like is the big, is the big factor, you know, um, in all of this. And that's where, like, what can you say to like some of the foods that we share often, if you want to add a little bit about that and like, why is it important? You know, that at least people doing this. I mean, I say if, if you have the ability to have one meal a day, at least, you know, of like clean food grown in the proper way, you know, regenerative, 
you're going to be doing pretty darn good, but two to three, you know, is going to be great. Right. So like, yeah. What would you say to, to something like that? Well, I mean, the human body is so exceptionally adaptive. And so we see people that eat and you know, like, I know, I know fellas that are, you know, just like pure Western males and they're in like, I eat, fast food burgers and fries and they've been doing it for years and they're still alive somehow which on its own you know in its own right is like wow that's the human body is fantastic um but the the difference in quality of food that you're receiving and how you will feel uh you can't really know until you experience it yourself right in terms of energy in terms of we've over the past several decades, we have slowly introduced, well, maybe not even slowly, we've introduced these practices in farming, the monocropping, the spraying with pesticides, the GMOing the, the genetics to grow a particular way. And then somehow we've just slowly or not so slowly also gotten sick, had these diseases pop up, these allergies pop up, these health ailments pop up. And so it's become kind of normalized or not really related to um, diet, right? So what, what could it be? What, you know, is it, is it the radiation? Is it the cell phone towers? Is it this, is it that? People will look anywhere else other than like, is it the food, right? And just like the way the rainforest is designed and the rest of nature is designed, the human body is designed to work in these cycles. Cells are made, cells die you know, tissue is formed, tissue dies. And if you're not properly replenishing those, those nutrients and those stocks, so the food that we are talking about, the food that we consume with Purium that's grown regeneratively, or if you're doing your own gardening, and this is, this is applicable as well, if you're doing your own gardening this summer, right, and you want to go regenerative farming, the quality of that food, it takes a couple of years to really get the soil built up, but the quality of that food um, is going to be so much more potent, you know, like when we consume our greens, uh, our green juice, our power shake, uh, we're having the equivalent of like six microgreen salads in one serving, but it's also six regenerative microgreen salads in one serving, right? So, you know, when we look at like, why is, why are people so sick? Why is the human body breaking down? Like this doesn't make sense. And it's like, well, no, because the body is designed. If you give it nutrients, it rebuilds and stays healthy. People think I'm eating these foods, therefore I'm getting these nutrients. Why am I not healthy? They're not, they're not. And when you start to see, like you said, once a day or twice a day or more often, you start to give your body the things that it actually needs to do stuff in an appropriate amount or even more than an appropriate amount in some cases, right? Uh, to, to get caught up, um, you start to see these really big changes, even just with like skin health, with, uh, you know, your response to like immune threats, right? And being around other people that are sick or that are drained, um, you know, your sleep patterns, you, you really start to notice because instead of doing these miraculous chemistry, you know, uh, conversions on basically fumes instead of fuel, your body is now being properly fueled and has the ability to really do what it needs to do. So, um, yeah, the, the foods that, that we have access to are just so much more potent and you, you, you start to notice a difference is, is I guess really the main thing that I could say is that you, you feel and notice a difference, uh, pretty quickly. And it's, I remember one person saying to me, like, what's in this, like, you know, because we looked at the ingredients and like, this doesn't make sense. I've had like a lot of this stuff before. And it's like, well, have you though? Like, have you had conventional this stuff? Or have you had like this stuff that actually has the appropriate amounts of, you know, nutrition that actually has the amount of vitamin C that that plant was supposed to actually have? Yeah, for sure. And I think the thing that I think about too is our food systems right now are broken. Like someone just, I, I posted something about seed oils yesterday and someone's like, what am I supposed to eat then? Like, as if, as if there's nothing else in the world to eat, you know? And the challenge is for some people, they are in spots and the, like, let's just say the U S for example, there are spots where there's nothing good to eat for them anywhere around. I was helping people with nutrition and stuff. And before this, 
And there'd be times where I'd be, you know, I'd recipes and this and that. And there'd be times where they'd be in an area where like the only thing they have nearby is a liquor store. Like, how am I going to make a recipe list from your local liquor store? You know? And so it's just like, there's real food challenges that some people are going through um, that they are not in the ability to grow their own garden. They don't have the space, right? Or maybe they feel like they don't have the time, right? Um, or someone's telling them, you need to juice this and you need to juice that and you need to buy this. And like, I don't have enough money for a juicer and I don't have time for a juicer and I don't even have quality foods nearby to juice. You know, like I have a liquor store. Like, what am I going to juice there? They got, uh, they got some old bananas there and some old apples, right? Olives, juiced olives. <laughs> they have some olives in a can, right? So there are some real challenges, right, that people are facing. I know even when I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to eat healthy, right? And I'm learning what healthy really means, like some of these things we're talking about. But I was in the Middle East at the time. And I did not, ha- they did not have as many options. They shipped everything from outside. They're in the middle of the desert. Um, and so you didn't have quite as quality options, right? Even the healthy restaurants, like they were shipping from all over the world just to get those healthy foods in there. Um, and so it wasn't like something that you could just go to your local market and get, like they were shipping from all over the world just to get those things in their own restaurants. Um, so there are real challenges and, you know, struggles. And I even know, I even someone I'm working with right now, they're like, they were telling me, oh my gosh, I was posting about watermelon, right? Cause we have a bunch of seeded watermelon all over the place here. And I mean, some people do in some cities, you know, not everyone does, but I am grateful that I do. And I was posting about it and they were like, oh my gosh, I don't remember the last time I had a good watermelon. Like, I can't remember the last time. And it's like, dang. And they're in California. Right. And, um, they're in an area in California where they don't have quality food, quality fruits nearby. She just doesn't have it nearby in her, her driving distance. Cause sometimes we were like, yeah, you got it over there in that city. Do you know where I live in relation to that city? I'm like two hours outside of that city. Like I can't, it's, that's not going to happen, you know, for some people, right. Or if some people were further, like there's so many different logistical challenges, right. Even when I was, even when I was is in, by the way, that person buys the superfoods and like gets it shipped right to their door. And she's very grateful because she can eat that in that area where she doesn't get it. When I was in Belize and I was sharing, co- I'm opening up coconuts, um, fresh, co- sprouted, like re- legit sprouted coconut, like, and like all these are different foods and like all these different fruits. And I can understand, I, I'm helping in a way that I'm sharing my lifestyle, but I'm also understand that I cannot, some people cannot get these foods. Like I'm in a very special place and people can't get these foods and it's just a reality. And also I can't ship these people, these foods that I'm growing nearby. And you can't ship the people, the food that you're growing nearby. Right. And that's one of the things that I realized. Right. And so now what I have and what we have is the ability to give someone access to these high quality, nutrient rich foods grown in regenerative soil, grown in, with green regenerative soil, which means green. They don't even they don't use animal manure, which is unique, right? Um, and so there's a lot of things plastic free, shipped to your door, even in, if you're in a food desert, even in if you're an area where there's no food around you, right? And that is special, and that is unique, and that is something that is great, and it is also something that is really, really affordable for most people. I work, I mean, my, I work with people that are literally on food stamps, have absolutely no money, no income. They're on like disability, right? They have incredible limitations and they're still able to add this in, right? That's amazing, right? Um, And there's people on the other spectrum that are like, have plenty of money, right? And they, it's not an issue, right? And they still say, this is still the best food I've ever seen. Even though I have enough, I've been, you know, I have access to buy whatever I want. They still say, this is, this is the choice of food that I choose. Right. 
And one thing that's really wild when I think about people that do have a lot of money, right, is what's really, really crazy is they have so much money, they still buy the lowest quality food. That that blows my mind. That's something that I'm like, I, I, that I don't understand, but I think it's this part. It's just a, it's just a lack of education, right? I was working with someone who's incredibly wealthy in San Diego, super wealthy. And we were on the topic of protein and he didn't know that plants have protein, right? And you would think someone like multi-millionaire, like super successful, like they know, they know that, you know what I mean? But they don't, it's not that it's just food and nutrition and our food systems, they're completely rigged. They're completely hijacked. The marketing is completely jacked. Like what, even when you think healthcare, health systems, like what that means to someone and what that means to you and me is totally different, right? And so there's a lot of things that are up against this. So I don't blame anyone, but also what I know and what I share and what you share, we want to help those. We want people to feel better. We want people to, to not have autoimmune diseases anymore like myself or not have diabetes or not have all these different things that are, that are completely destroying them. Right. And going vegan. And we talk about that a lot and eating, not is tells me what you're not eating. Right. And is a huge piece because, you know, animal products, right. From the, from, from meat, right. To dairy, to eggs, right. All of those ones and cheese, all of those ones are contributing to this issue, right? But they're not the only things that are, they're not the only things in the food system that are contributing to issues, right? And it is important that we look beyond that. Sometimes I say going vegan is not the most you can do. It's the least you can do. It's like, that's a huge stepping stone in my mind. That's the least that we should be doing um, in our mindset um, and what we're doing for the world, Right. But it's not the only thing that we can do. And, and also don't limit yourself to that's why I say for some people that are in that in that situation, like it's the, I was there before. I was like, this is the most important thing that we could possibly do. Right. And it is a huge piece. But it once you know better, you can do better. So when I learned that there's something that I could do better, I was like, OK, I can do a little bit better. I can make a small improvement here. And it was gradual. I did personally go vegan overnight. It was really easy, but I don't expect that from everyone. Right. But I do think that everyone can do it. It is possible. Right. Um, as well as once I learned that, I learned a lot more things, you know, when it came to nutrition. And I said, well, once I learned this, like, I'm not, I'm also not going to put this in my body. <laughs> you know, like this, this other thing doesn't belong there too. Right. Um, and so that's just kind of a little bit. So yeah, we want to add anything to wrap this up, Mike. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, when you're talking about um, being in Belize or like people that live these really healthy lifestyles, right? They're eating fresh coconuts and fresh fruits and tropical, like local fresh fruits, um, you know, and they get these huge uh, followings and it's great. And they're promoting, you know, like we, we I think both follow or at least both know and maybe a lot of people that, that follow us or will see this know uh, Fully Rock Christina. Right. And she's she's in, I think, in the millions of followers now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and she's always been promoting for for a decade plus. She's been promoting, you know, raw eating and she she posts and eats these like beautiful, super colorful meals. Um, but, you know, where she lives and the food she has access to, I mean, when she first started her platform off, she lived in like a farming Mecca of Texas right next to like a giant farming area where she was able to build a co-op and had like an abundant, like talking about watermelon. I mean, they, they had the old pictures. I remember them having, like they had, you know, amazing access to watermelon. So you get these people that are building this following in this lifestyle. And, and, you know, when I say following, that means there are millions of people that look at it and say, I like this. I want this, this appeals to me. But unfortunately, like she now lives on her own, like private slice of land in like a tropical island down south. I mean, not a lot of us do, you know, she grows her own bananas and like her own, you know. So, yeah, that's that's great. And yes, promote it and show how wonderful these foods are for people. But beyond, you know, people following her page or sharing a recipe, uh, she can't really reach out or help people with that or give that gift to anyone else and i think that's one of the beauties of what perium is doing and i think is only going to continue to grow right is tapping into that and that that need that exists that 
that obviously exists and that people are very interested in and developing or, or we already have developed uh you know using the developed method of delivering this nutrition delivering delivering this quality of living to people anywhere in the world without losing the living enzymes without losing the nutritional potency when i see someone like fully raw christina i agree with everything that you say you know and i've seen her story as well and and I think like, man, when they, they love what she's doing and they want to go do it, right? They're going to buy her juicer that she recommends, right? They're going to go buy, you know, the local fruits around them. You know, some will have some good ones and most will have not very good ones, right, around them. And they'll just do the best that they can, right? But they're not going to get to the level of quality that she is at because she's at maximum peak, like the ideal, everything organic, all homegrown, nutrient wrench. She's probably growing a regenerative soil as well. Right. And so what imagine if she gave something like it, it maybe Purim itself or something exactly like it, you know, to all of her people to say, Hey, I know you can't quite get this food, but this is the next best option that you can get. Right. And in some cases it might even be better, right? Depending on how it's grown, right? Like I would argue that some of the superfoods, like she can't grow some of those superfoods on her land, right? She is just, is just, that's not even possible. So I would argue even some of the foods that are growing could even be better than what she's growing there. So she could even, she could say, see what I got here, but I can give you something even better, right? That'd be pretty amazing. I think I look at that. There's a lot of people that I, I've worked with and I've talked with and they're like, they have such incredible things around them and near them, just like her, like not exactly as big as fully raw Christina, but very similar, like very similar mission based or mindset and building and maybe even juicing or maybe even giving people, or maybe they have their own company, little, little juicing company. And they're, you know, they're helping people. Right. And it's so amazing what they can do in their local community. But I'm like, what about that person in Oklahoma? What about that person in Texas? What about that person even in California? It's a desert, California. Well, they got a lot of rain recently, but it's still a desert. Like there's still food deserts all over the place. Like even in the, look at Oakland, right? Oakland in California is like known to be like a lot of food deserts within that city, which just across the bay, San Francisco, which is arguably one of the vegan hubs in, in all of America. But you could be living in Oakland across the bridge with hundreds of vegan options uh, just across the bridge with not enough money or not enough access to get over there, you're just not going to go across there, right? Because you're, you're, you're stuck in your situation, right? So like, you can help those people, you know, how are they, how, how you make juice in New York, how are you going to give your juice in New York to someone in California, you can't help them that much, you can share your advice, but they're not going to get that quality that you're sharing what you're sharing on your page. It'd be amazing if they could get but it's just unlikely that they're going to get that. unlikely. And in some situations, yeah, but just not as much. And I think that that's, that's what's a unique impact that you can give people um, uh, anywhere, you know, in Canada, US, right? Like really high quality and plastic free. And that's another thing. Canada's like that too, right? You know Canada more, but like the huge vastness and emptiness of it, right? In so many areas yeah. and the, like frozenness of like certain places, <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, and like seasonally, you know, I, I, I farm and I do regenerative farming and, and outdoor hydroponic farming and all that kind of stuff, but like it's only for a portion of the year, right? Like we definitely have a long, long off season. Um, but, and just specifically to what you were saying about like the, the people like Fully Rock Christina and, and what have you, I mean, that is the ultimate. And I, I've said before myself, even, you know, if, if I could, I would grow most of my own stuff you know, and there'd be certain things, let's say like carrot juice from, from Curium. I mean, if I had my own multi hundred acre property and I was regeneratively farming carrots, I probably wouldn't buy their carrot juice, but do I grow dragon fruit? Do I grow passion fruit? Do I grow like, you know, you start looking at like some of the other elements there and with someone like fully raw Christina, the problem is no one can grow everything if they're in one place, unless you own or can get everywhere to all the climates of the planet, you can't grow all of the various plants that we can benefit from. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, if you really want to support a mission bigger than our lifespan, that's bigger than us, you know, supporting Purium and supporting the equipment that Purium has to transport 
food as living food anywhere in the planet, anywhere on the planet, I should say. You know, the, the more Purium grows, the more that that equipment and that mission can grow or spread. And we will get to a point where we are able to actually ship, you know, the majority or all of the different types of foods that we can grow anywhere on the planet. And people everywhere on the planet could have access to all of the foods on the planet you know, in their healthiest form. So yeah, there, you know, there's, there's a lot of possibility, but it takes, it will take time and it's, it's bigger than us, but, but it's a very worthwhile mission to, to be a part of and to support. And in the short term, you're supporting, you know, local farming, organic farming, non-GMO, uh, people like ourselves who are out trying to help others and who are using their money to help others and support sanctuaries and charities and other things. So yeah. And um, Good. And then those that can, like what you're saying, and those that can do what Foley Raw Christina does or anything similar, do it when you can. You know what I mean? But if you can't, like this is a good in-between and a good step in the right direction, you know, and and then you could also build upon that, you know, and potentially build your own um, in the future, you know, which is a huge goal of mine. Like, of course, like I've part of why I was in Belize and part of what I have is because that's part of what I want to do. And when I see, you know, the future of, you know, even the land that they've has, for example, like I see that as like, I want something like this, you know, like, like this is something, you know, that's, it's in the works, it's in the process, you know, and, you know, then you have yourself set up, you know, and, but I still, even, even if I had that, I would still feel like it's not, not that it's not enough. It'd be plenty for me and my family, right and and whoever i care about but it wouldn't be enough for the people like all the other people that i want to impact you know so i would still have to have something to 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 help people you know even if i did have something like that how do you get your food to others then that's why yeah, I yeah. Say the the idea of supporting this mission not just because of how it benefits each person eating the food it benefits each of us sharing the food but it it will help propel a mission and a technology that is going to allow for the spreading of really healthy living food everywhere. And it's, it, it really could change the dynamic of human health and the landscape of human health. Um, so that's, that's my take on regenerative farming. I, I, there's so much to it, but you know, I, I hopefully we've, we've kind of grazed over some of the topical stuff that at least people can understand that there is, there is a difference. And, and this is some of what's involved in it, why it is worth, you know, if, even if it is an extra, you know, uh, dollar on a, you know, instead of a $6 grocery item, you're buying a $7 grocery item or something. I mean, you're supporting so much, you're helping so many other people, but you're also getting a lot more in that food for yourself. So it, it is worth it. And one last thing to wrap it up. I think it's something for every single person, no matter what diet you're eating, no matter what you're on currently, right? No matter how you're eating, no matter whether you're vegan or vegetarian or keto, no matter what your mindset is, this is for, this food is great for everyone to add in to whatever they're doing. This isn't like you have to change everything and you have to go change your whole entire lifestyle. You just need to add this into whatever you're doing and it's going to make the impact. You know, um, so I think that that's great because that's another thing that people struggle with so much when they're trying to help people. It's like, no, you have to do this diet and this and this and this. No, add, no, just add this in. You just need to add this in, right? We could talk about all the things that you need to take out, but start adding, you know, and oftentimes you add in the good, the bad just starts falling away. Just, it, it just starts, they just, your body does not want whatever is not supposed to be there it starts telling you that's not supposed to be there anymore and so you let your body tell you what's supposed to happen and i think that that's really powerful all right so um thank you so much mike i appreciate you this is great and um see you all next week um same time and uh chat soon